In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to you and to those watching at home. We miss you. We are praying you're doing well today. Just like we had last week, the lectionary writers today also give us two stories into one narrative. Last week, you remember, they gave us a story within a story. Likewise, today. Although both stories today are related, both stand as separate units that deserved to be studied separately. Now, a little bit of context. You may recall last week, Mark posed a question for all of us. The question was, what is faith? He contrasted two groups of people to try to answer that question. The first group of people were the crowds that had been following Jesus from Mark chapter 3, where in chapter 6, have been following Jesus, and they have witnessed all sorts of great events, great events uh, that Jesus has performed, and still, many of them, the great majority of them do not believe. He contrasts those people with two very unlikely folks. The first one is a Jewish synagogue leader. The second one is an ill woman on the edge of society. These two unlikely characters put their faith in Jesus and obtain the answer to their prayers. In the passage for today, Mark is going to compare once again the faith of these two very unlikely people to the faith of his own people in his hometown. Naively, we would ask, or we would say, if he has been so believed and so liked, so loved by so many people, including these two unlikely characters of last week's story, how much more? Is he going to be believed, loved, welcomed in his own hometown? They are going to have a parade for him. The marching band from the local high school is going to be playing for him. They're going to be singing for he's a jolly good fellow. Yet those closest to Jesus are often the most blind about him, his identity, his mission for the world. Today, we get a word of caution for Mark. Last week, we got a question, what is faith? Today, we get a word of caution. Be careful of thinking you are an insider in Jesus' family just because you have spent time with him. It may just be that you are just as likely to take him for granted as his own family takes him for granted. Jesus is home preaching at the local synagogue. Last time he was here, his family believed that he was crazy. They ran from their home to the meeting place where Jesus was to try to rescue him. They were outright embarrassed. Now he's back with his disciples in his hometown, and it is the Sabbath day. At some point, he begins to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. Why were they astounded? Because he was preaching with a command of the Judean scriptures that even seasoned rabbis did not have. Additionally, in his speech, he was showing many of the rhetorical and didactic skills that many Greco-Roman philosophers of renown had popularized. He was talking like a popular uh, teacher of some kind. He is showing both Judean and Greco-Roman wisdom, yet they know him to be a tradesman, a town's kid, he used to bag my groceries at HEV. This is a hometown kid. As far as the crowds were concerned, Jesus did not have the type of pedigree 
required for this type of teaching. He is now from the upper classes. Usually those classes can afford to send their boys to a rabbinical school or to a famous rabbi for four or five years of instruction from the ages of 13 to the 18. But Jesus was working at the shop during those years. We remember. We saw him. He is not a Roman citizen. They are utterly confused. While he is teaching, they reach over to each other and they whisper in each other's ears, where did this man get all of this? What is this wisdom given to him? In their mind, he is either a pretender with airs of grandeur, or he was never the boy they all knew. A liar somehow, an actor of some kind. Of these two options, the first, the most likely, he is a pretender. He is trying to be someone he's not. He's like Father Roldan who memorizes two, poem, two, two jokes from the internet and makes it sound as though he is a world comedian to you all. He is an imposter. What confuses them even more is his reputation. By the time he gets back to this synagogue where he's been once before, there were many stories circulating about him. He is performing all these great works of wonder. He heals people sometimes just by the power emanating from his garments. He has power over storms and other weather phenomena. He can feed multitudes with just a few loaves of bread. They tell each other what deeds of power are being done by his hands. It absolutely makes no sense. As far as they know, this man was a carpenter. Part of the low middle class, if there is such a thing, they all took offense to him. He is not poor because he doesn't hire himself for day labor. He's not a servant. He's not a slave. So he falls into that artist, artisan category of low middle class. And then they showed their dislike for him by using a very pejorative, insulting, hurtful label. They say, isn't this the son of Mary? The proper way to refer to anyone in first century Palestine is by appeal to the father of the father's family, now by appeal to the mother. Isn't this John, son of Simon? Isn't this Simon, son of Jonah? Isn't this somebody, son of a male? Mesha ben David, the Messiah, son of David? It's usually by appeal to the father, not appeal to the mother. And then he says, aren't his brothers James and Judas and Joseph and Judas and Simon and his sisters here with us? The use of a mother implies an illegitimate birth. Jesus says to them, prophets are now without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. This is the second time he comes home in the Gospel of Mark, and both times have been a disaster. The first time, they believe he's mentally ill. They run to rescue him, armed with a bunch of Prozac and, and a bunch of medicines and perhaps some restraints. Now, they believe that he is an illegitimate pretender who is putting on airs. Mark tells us that, he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. He was amazed at their unbelief. He was amazed at their lack of faith. It was extremely hard for the town's folks to reconcile the images they had of him. They had his furniture and his father's furniture in their homes. They saw every day. Chairs and tables, beds, dressers, chests to say mementos and important items. Jesus was an artisan, part of the local economy of the people. 
And yet, his listeners who have grown with him are listening to him and he's pretending to be one of the great rabbis. They know he had no formal education. Yet Jesus is pretending to be an itinerant preacher who claims to be Messiah. How can this be? Now when I think about this episode between Jesus and the townsfolk, I often remember a famous quote by C.S. Lewis, and I've used this quote before, so I apologize, I'm going to use it again. C.S. Lewis used to say, a man who was merely a man and said the sorts of things and did the sorts of things that Jesus said and did would not be seen by his people as a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of the man who says, I am a poached egg, or else he would be the devil. In Mark 3.23, some of the listeners accuse Jesus of being possessed. With the power of Satan, he casts out Satan, they say. Now, in his hometown, they all believe he's crazy and an imposter. Only a few are willing to acknowledge a third option. That this man truly is the son of David, the Messiah. The one who was coming into the earth, into the world, the savior of the world. They had no use for this Jesus. And for this reason, he was unable to do any miracles in his hometown. We said last week that in Mark, faith is nothing more than to acknowledge our weakness and our dependence on God through his son. Well, if that is faith, these people have no faith. They are not willing to acknowledge that they were in need. They're not willing to acknowledge that a lowly carpenter they knew so well could ever be the Messiah announced by the scriptures. How could they ask this imposter for help? How could they even associate with this deluded man? At most, all they do is feel pity for his family they knew so well. How embarrassed they must have felt. How disappointed they must be. This kid showed such great promise as a carpenter. By now he should have a big shop in Jerusalem, and maybe one in Galilee and one in places in between. By now this Jesus the carpenter should have franchised. He should be bigger than raising canes. He had such great promise, but he blew it all away. Like a young boy wearing a giant's clothes, he pretends to be a great teacher. It really is comical, really. This man is an absolute joke. They who felt they knew him so well did not know him at all. They fail to realize that often the divine presence chooses to dwell in the familiar, in the commonplace, in the everyday of our lives. They, like us, are willing to look for God in the extraordinary, in the great acts of nature. In the pilgrimage sites where miraculous events have taken place. In St. Peter's Square, in all the wonders of the world, we're willing to see God. When Colombia beats its enemy 5-0 in soccer, it is easy to believe God exists. And he's from Medellin. Yet we fail to see him walking by our side in a busy street sitting next to us in a plane or in a restaurant, listening to us through the ears of a compassionate, empathic friend, speaking to us through the voice of a child at a park, calling in us, calling in us to him at a local community center or a local church. The sad thing is that we who have studied God 
and have read scripture are often the most blind to Christ's presence in the world. The sad thing is that we who call ourselves a city on the hill, blessed by God as the greatest empire on the face of the world, sometimes confused Jesus of Nazareth and make him into our own image. He's so familiar to us that we fail to see him around us. We have molded Christ into our image, and now all we can see is what we have made Christ to be. We have muscled Christ, and now we're insulated against his words, which are always challenging of our complacency and our apathy. We have westernized Christ, and now we see him as John Wayne or Rumble, always ready to take down our enemies. We have psychologized Christ, and now he's merely concerned with our wounded egos and our lack of self-esteem. We have politicized Christ, and now he's very, very busy blessing and protecting all dictators and strongmen, totalitarian politicians. We have made him into what we want, and it is precisely because we know him so well that we have failed to recognize him as the Messiah, Son of God, Liberator, neither Republican nor Democrat, Messiah, Son of God, Liberator. Today, Mark asks you a question. Who is this Jesus for you? Be careful how you answer, because you may not know him as well as you think. May he continue to bless you. Amen.